Dr. Robin Hickman Winfield. Hickman Winfield? All right. Okay. All right. Um, we are going to get started with a series of questions. Uh, if any of our moderators uh, come in, I mean, of our panel come in late, you know, we um, just come on up and have a seat. Is that all right? All right. So let's get started. Um, the panelists whom I've introduced, their bios are in the program that you've read. So you'll see that each and every one of them are qualified to be here. Okay. So let's start making trouble. Huh? Yeah, we're going to start shooting the questions. Okay. The first one being that our theme for today is about the regentrification of Rondo. I got was a few people I ain't got their attention, but I know vendors are talking, but that's all right. Um, are you, well, let me see. We all right? We all, okay. All right then. So the first question, um, are you familiar with the Rondo community in St. Paul, Minnesota? That's the easy one, so. Is it on? Did you turn it on? Is it on? Take, take it off. Yours working? He did, he did turn it on, but um, absolutely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to establish it even deeper. Being a fifth generation Minnesotan, um, being a descendant of Rondo through my grandmother and my father, um, so definitely. Um, but I would say, um, I like to share a, a, a Mexican proverb that says, they thought they buried us, but didn't know we were seeds. And that's speaking to the destruction, the, the attempted destruction of Rondo. But um, we migrated to, to Selby Dale. I grew up in the Selby Dale community and where I got to grow up and see the fruits of Rondo live on. And so being also a child of Selby Dale, Summit University, community where we, where we, we, hey, we survived and we're surviving and thriving. Um, my family had a farm on uh, St. Albans and University uh, 170 years ago in the 1850s when Minnesota was still part of the Wisconsin or Northwest Territories. And I've had the uh, honor of living in both Cornmill Valley, east of uh, Dale Street and Oakmill Hill west of Dale Street. So uh, Rondo is uh, part of my DNA, and I'm uh, very pleased to be here with you this morning, and good morning. All right. Everybody all right? Were you able to hear the responses to those questions? You were not. That's because you were busy. We're not going to talk about you. You were busy. The question was, are you familiar with the Rondo community in St. Paul, Minnesota? And these people were born and raised here in Rondo. And so, you know, really the answer was just yes. But they gave you a definitive answer because they are a distinguished panel. OK. Now, pardon me. And we do. I want to introduce um, our new panel member. Her name is Michi X. Welcome her, please. Meech, yes, from Atlanta, but Meech, I mean, being that you got here, you know, um, while questions was being answered, you have an opportunity to ask to answer the question as well. And that question was, are you familiar with the Rondo community in St. Paul, Minnesota? Well, Michi, it's all right, because there's some people that live right here in Rondo that's not familiar, okay? Just so you know. You, 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 all right. No, don't feel bad at all. Ain't that right, Robin? All right. Uh, well, let's see, see, see that this whole, you know, everything that we're doing is about the regentrification of Rondo and such. Um, the next question is, in your opinion... Why do you think the United States government enacted the National Interstate and Defense Highways Act of 1956 and put these freeway systems in black communities across the United States, which destroyed Rondo Avenue, which had at least 300 plus black owned businesses and homes at the time? Well, 
Federal Highway A Act of 1956, also known as the National Interstate and Defense Highways Act, was enacted June 28, 1956, when President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed the bill into law. With an original authorization of $25 billion to fund the first 41,000 miles of interstate highway, the uh, period for the original act was a 10 year period. Excuse me, please. Well, it was the largest public works project in America through that time. Uh, two things. One, the word defense we'll was included in the title of the law because they needed a military That's justification a in order to pass it through Congress. Okay? The first route to I 94 was along Pierce Buckner route, but they said it was too expensive and too costly. The second proposed route was University Avenue, but the businesses, the car dealerships, Brown, Bigelow, Montgomery Ward, and the other white power structure fought successfully against it, as did George Latimer and Company when they wanted to make Interstate 35E part of the interstate rather than a parkway with a 45 mile speed limit. The uh, act allowed for seizing land and buildings through some fellow named Eminent Domain, which meant the government could just walk in and take it. And there was nothing that the homeowner or landowner could do about it. Okay, also, they paid for the buildings that they tore down with what is called salvage value, which means how much money they could get from the materials that were located in the building. So many of the people in the black community who lived on St. Anthony or Rondo had their houses taken by eminent domain. They were paid salvage value, which meant that most of them received less than they still owed for the houses if they had a mortgage in place on them. And Rondo, the block between Rondo and St. Anthony was chosen because it provided the least economic, political, and social resistance, right through the heart of the black community and low-income white communities. And this was the case in Detroit, in Chicago, in Atlanta, in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Newark, Camden, across the country. We were the path of least resistance for the interstate, and that is why the freeways came through our community. Now, this is 1956. What happened in 1954 of significance in the black community? Brown versus Board of Education. That signaled the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan, the Citizens Councils, the John Birch Society, the Libertarian Party, okay? And white people, excuse me, we're, we're having a workshop here. Wait, well, hang on one second, uh, and excuse me. Excuse me. This is the discussion part of the program. The discussion. And there are some people who cannot hear the responses to the questions. I just ask that you refrain and maybe turn your voices down just a bit so that others can hear the discussion. Thank you very much. Please continue. Um, in 1950, there was another act passed which was sponsored by a Democrat from Nevada whose name was McCarran. It was called the McCarran Act. How many people are familiar with the McCarran Act? Anybody in here ever hear of that? Anybody in here familiar with the McCarran Act? The nickname for the McCarran Act was the Concentration Camp Law. And again, um, defense and military <laughs> funded. And part of the rationale was that the freeway would be recessed in urban communities. So that if we had a meeting of the, um, the organizing and the chaos that occurred, after the Brown v. Board of Education, after the murder of Emmett Till, after Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, sitting there thinking about what had happened to Emmett Till three weeks earlier, that the freeways could be used as concentration camps to the communities. The military only had to say. Urban 
insurrection under control. So the McCarran Act, the Hunter Defense Act, the fact that there were limited funds for eminent domain and for salvage value, so they picked again the communities with the least economic, political, and social resistance. And that is why Interstate 94 goes right through the heart of St. Paul and Toronto community and our community. Thank you, Mr. Mangini. Dr. Winfield, would you like to respond to that as well? Or oh, he said it all? Did he say it all? Huh? Panel, you agree? Okay. Um, sure. is a structure that there has to be a class of people on the bottom for those to win on the top, and that has always been us. He made a very good point in saying we are the communities with the least resistance, and he used the word politically. And I, I think that if we look and we really focus on the fact that it all comes back, everything's politics, but we are the ones who are constantly um, giving votes, right, without getting anything back in return. And we are the ones that are constantly used to be stepped on, right? And we don't have that resistance, um, whether it is politically um, or whether it is us coming together to show that resistance. But this happens everywhere. And so I just want to point that out because a lot of people will say, you know, why don't we get up and just kind of get stuff together in our communities? But I think we have to understand there is a very, um, very specific effort from the government, right? <laughs> How do you fight that? From the government to make sure that we do not excel and we do not get to where we need to be. It's not all about our communities are just broken down. We keep them that way. We don't do what we're supposed to do. It is much more complex than that. So that is all that I wanted to add to what he said. And also to that, sister, um, I'm a TV and film producer, have loved being a media maker and keeper of our narrative since I was a, as a child. One of the things I saw in our bios, love seeing about Youssef, who was one of my mentors, Urban Journalism Workshop, which I was a student in that, you know, that intentional making sure even as young people, we were on the case of taking our rightful place as young media makers. But while I had a career in public broadcasting, there was a, a, a filmmaker that did a whole documentary on around the country, that movement, that freeways taking out. It was a powerful documentary. So I knew, I learned then, it did not just happen here. It went on all over the country, the, that the black communities, and it declared about taking out our economic heartbeats throughout the country. And as we celebrate Dr. King, and I think about the theme of this occasion, walking in this morning, even being patted down by security. I said, they mean business. They mean bi the security of black folks coming together to take care of business is important. I like, hey, go ahead, brother. Put the wand on me. I love that. The spirit of quality and black excellence when I walked in felt good. Right? That felt good. But the business and our economic powerment, right, was right. Because I think about my favorite scripture, one of my favorite scriptures for such a time as this. And the spirit of the time is now. And we think about Dr. King. See, they try to silence his voice. We started talking about our economic agenda. And I think about those free was taking out our economic heartbeats around the country. But the fact that they did it all over the country to black people, the opportunity we have now when we teach the history of what that was about. And you said broke it down, knowing that it happened all over the place. Think about the might we could have collectively around the country. Sisters, you're talking about this is a movement. I didn't know this was Bob was a movement. My dad's name being Bobby. I like that. Bob. Yes, I love it. A national movement I didn't know. So I'm learning. Love it. This is our, it is our time now. 
I love it. And so I just thank you. So I feel, it, 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 with my brother Ronald, thank you again for inviting me. You know, I, I, because I'm ready as I push, I'm getting ready. This might get turn 60. It's on a popping with Rob. <laughs> so I, I appreciate this, but this, it is our time, and our time is now. So I appreciate this. Think ownership. I'm a business owner, so I get that. We do have a seat on the panel for you, ma'am, if you'd yes. like to join us. Yeah, you might as well come up here, sister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sit on up here. <laughs> we definitely got a seat for you. Do we have a mic for it, too? Yes, we do. Come on, right here next to me. Mm -hmm. You get next to Dr. Winfield. So as I said, there's 900 and at least 93 cities that were affected by the 1956, the 1966 Highway Act. Okay. And that is the number one basis for reparations for us as people. One of them, besides the debt that's owed from slavery itself, picking cotton and tobacco, whatever, right? But the, the, the fact that these, you know, they displaced us. We have a homeless problem that's almost 50% across the country. Okay. And I'm saying that, and it's really sad when you start seeing it where you live, because when you traveled and you lived in places like Dallas, Houston, Vegas, California, Los Angeles, we've always known New York had a homeless problem, right? But when you start seeing tent cities and, and, and Minneapolis, St. Paul, you know it's more about, it's, it's about, because we, don't have, we didn't have ownership. We had a problem with people, and still today, still not owning. But I want to let you know there's a lady right there. You see her? Associated Bank in the green shirt. She's one of our sponsors. And she, everybody in this room, if you don't own a home, she's got a program for you. Don't think you've got to have this superb credit. Don't think you got this money right now because our movement is bringing in dollars for home ownership. That's why, you, you know, this, and this is across the country. Our movement is very strong, even though the media is trying to downplay us right now because it's a very strong movement. You know, Michi, you know what that's about. So don't I'm get sorry. me started, child. You know, you know, you know, I was going to come fan in you getting. in a minute. I was, <laughs> I you know, I was about to step over there. Um, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to miss? I wanted to add something if that's okay. I wanted to take it a little deeper because, you know, we were talking about coming through and destroying things and taking us in a position where they just displace us. And, and, and again, I say they have to have a class to step on. So a lot of times people are confused when I say that because they're like, how do the poor class keep everybody rich? So it is imperative to them that we stay in a situation of destitute and being poor. And the reason is, is because the government is very corrupt and everything they will lock you up in jail for, they do legally. So they need you to be poor because poor people have sickness. Poor people People need Medicaid. Poor people live in communities that crime is committed, so therefore more people go to prison. Everything that they need you to do is a way of laundering the tax dollars from the citizens to fund it to the real drug dealers. So we need poor people to be on Medicaid, and we need them to live in poor conditions and have food deserts and not eat right, because then we can send you to the doctor and give off fund all that money to those doctors, to the pharmaceutical companies, but we'll lock you up for selling drugs. Right? But they can say drugs and, and things like that to you. Also, crime does pay. They told you crime don't pay their line. They want you to commit crime, and crime is a product of poverty, mental illness, and that comes from all that stuff, and we'll get in that later. I won't go too deep in that, but I just want us to have an understanding why they want us to be poor, because our poorness actually makes 
entities within the government that fund the politicians and it makes them filthy rich. So please understand, even though we may be the lowest class of people in this country, we are the ones that make everybody wealthy. Okay. Well, also too, besides Ms. Gibson, we have two other distinguished gentlemen that have joined the panel. I'll allow them to introduce themselves now. Um, my name is Tommy McBrayer. I'm the founder and CEO of Don't Shoot, Gun, Shoot Hoops, where we use the game of basketball, bring awareness to gun violence um, by doing positive stuff in the neighborhood, All doing right. violent prevention events um, to keep these kids off the street. So. All right. North Minneapolis is going green. Give us a call and learn what we mean. Where one sly urban blight now sits luscious garden sites, gardens without borders, classrooms without walls, architects of our own destinies, access to food, justice for all. And now, like sweet potato vines, our missions and goals all intertwine. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Michael Cheney. I'm an activist and organizer. In the 80s, I was the founder of the Juneteenth celebration in the state of Minnesota. In the 90s, I was the founder of the Wendell Phillips Credit Union. And in 2010, when North High came under attack, and there were those within the educational system who felt that North High, its time had come and gone, um, I and others came out in response because we felt that the killing of a school is the killing of any heart of any community. And so in all good consciousness, we couldn't sit back passively and watch it happen. And so I approached the school and asked them if I could get the youth of North Minneapolis to start growing uh, vegetables, could I utilize the green room that had been fallow there for over 10 years? They agreed and thus Project Sweetie Pie was born. The story of a community that came together, worked together for the common good of the youth and families of its community, for it takes a village to raise a child. Over the course of the last 10 years, we have uh, I created the first urban farm legislation in the nation. Uh, it's a, called the Agri Grant, where if you're training young people in horticulture, you can apply for up to $50,000 through the Minnesota State um, Agri Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And I'm currently working with uh, Kimball Musk, who is Elon Musk's brother, and for working with them. Um, we have a $6 million fund that we're deploying to BIPOC organizations across the country, and Project Sweetie Pie is on the governance board. So we're growing good in the neighborhood. Good food, good schools, good youth and families. Education never tasted so good. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, this next question, Dr. Winfield, um, I, I, and I know you've lived this, so... I need to uh, start off with you. Are you familiar with how blacks migrated to Minnesota and where they first arrived? Oh my goodness, yeah, I, I am, I have my own personal story, yes, and I know they migrated from many places. My, my personal story is that our people came from Kentucky. There were about 90 some odd families came on their way, some on the way to Canada, stopped up in the Aiken County area, Fergus Falls, some landed in North, South Dakota, North Dakota. Um, but um, Fergus Falls, many families in Fergus Falls landed there. Um, beautiful story, beautiful, beautiful story. Um, so you have the Andersons and the Frasers and the Tates. Pattersons, we got to talk about. Maybe we could. We might be cousins, girl. You're also the niece of Gordon Parks. Don't well, that's that's part of that. But see, you know what? And I saw that in there. And I love Uncle Gordon. I do a lot to make sure. I love him. I am. I'm his grand niece, okay, right. and I make sure that I keep his legacy alive. That promise that I I made to my uncle. Um, but I'm also proud again to be fifth generation Minnesotan. I'm proud to be a descendant of the Frasers. And those families that landed in Fergus Falls. My great great grandparents are buried on the north shore of Lake Malak. See, when folks come to me acting like I'm not supposed to be here, I can look other uh -huh. folk. Yeah. Like my people probably been here longer than yours. Yeah. So when we talk about engaging in movements to reclaim that which was stolen from us, when we can have a posture like that's grounded in knowing we got some deep history here, right? It strengthens us. 
And so those were those families that, that, that came. When I can go up to Aiken County to the Historical Society and see from my great grandniece and nephew's names in that register all the way up to my great great grandparents, that's power, right? But also my, my family, my grandmother Lillian Parks Thomas and Uncle Gordon Parks and all. So there's a lot of history. And again, it's teaching our children that history. And it's the young lady saying, Lift every voice and sing beautifully, and we joined in. There's some simple things. San Kofa, go back and reclaim that which was lost, and I'd add stolen. But some simple things. We've lived some of the answers we seek today. I would like to bring the Black National Anthem back to our children and make sure that they learn every word. When we were children, we couldn't even look at the paper. We had to plant that in our hearts deep. We need to bring that back to our babies. Because their every word is what they need to armor them up. So we can do this battle we got in front of us. I'm very much involved in the reclaiming of Rondo. Very much involved. But part of it is knowing that history, knowing where you came from. And for those of us who have those deep roots here, and we can go back and look at our lineage, that's going to fortify us. That's going to armor us up. Right. So, yes, deep roots. Go, Uncle Gordon, love him. But my, my mother's side, really, really deep, proud. When we all go up and we used to take pilgrimages up to Fergus Falls, it was some deep stuff. And they migrated down to North Minneapolis. Right, Mama, down in North Minneapolis and South Minneapolis. And you know, back in the day when the St. Paul guys used to go get the girls from Minneapolis, back, vice versa, all that little stuff. Um, they landed over here in St. Paul, but proud. Deep history and stories that need to be need to be told. Andre Simone's daddy, born in Fergus Falls. Jimmy Jam's mother, my grandmother, good friend, born in Fergus Falls. A lot of stories, a lot of rich stories. Let me show my little uh, two cent real quick. Uh, um, being a um, African American, thirty three years old. I'm not from St. Paul, but I'm from Central Neighborhood uh, in yes. South Minneapolis. Oh, you about my age. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, we look the same age, <laughs> but um, I don't know when exactly when we first came to Minnesota, but I know Rondo community and Central community had the same relationship, right? It was these are black hubs in both cities, right? Um, growing up in Central neighborhood it was all black businesses. You know, this was the first Central neighborhood was the first neighborhood in in Minneapolis to. Uh, for black uh, for black businesses to be ran uh, for uh, black ownership for housing um, and the same thing for uh, Rondo community. So I think it's important to learn the Rondo community in the central community because they're so they're so similar. Um, even though we got the uh, the black hub of Sabathony, um, we hold um, the neighborhood for uh, for Prince Prince uh, grew up in central neighborhood. Prince uh, um, was married in central neighborhood, and I, uh, like my man said. Um, Whenever you take take a school outside the community, which was Bryan High School, yeah. Bryan High School was uh, a school that Prince went to high school that's now Sabathony. And if you learn the history of it, that when Bryan High School closed, it was the worst thing that happened to the neighborhood, right? Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, we're living in this era of kids are not going to school in their own neighborhood no more, right? right? You're going to these suburb schools or you're going something that's 20 blocks away type of thing, right? Not, you're not going to a hub that represents your, your, your culture now. Right. Um, so I just wanted to share that just like, yeah, it is important to know your history. And now we got the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder. That's a historical landmark in Minneapolis, probably one of the uh, oldest uh, historical landmarks in Minneapolis. Um, that's still up and running right now. Black um, black uh, newspaper um, company uh, in Sabathony. You know, Sabathony is the, uh, one of the oldest nonprofit organizations that's uh, still black owned uh, still to this day on 38th and uh, 2nd Avenue over South Minneapolis. So we got to hold on to the black, you know, um, I, I'm pro black when it comes to things, you know, I, I'm for my people. I represent my people. I make a room for my people being a community organizer in that same neighborhood as community, uh, of central neighborhood. That's, that's our job. You know, me being 33 years old and they're like, well, what's your job? My job is to create more space for black people, you know, for black businesses, for my, for my black people. And at the same time, me, I, on a personal note, I'm a survivor of gun violence, right? So don't shoot guns, shoot hoops is my way of using my platform and my tra uh, traumatic situation, my trauma to save other youth. 
You know, um, it's crazy right now. Young adults are from 18 years old to 40 years old, right? But now 40 years old is almost impossible to get to in the African-American uh, uh, community. These, these guys ain't make it to 40 years old no more, right? And so now 40 years old is old in, in the black community, right? When it should be a young adult. You should still be a young adult at 40 years old compared to somebody that's 90, right? So it's, I think it's important to learn where you come from, learn your roots, um, and, and enhance it, right, and protect it because we, they say anything that's American, anything, any, every time you put American after any name, you're washed up. So we, we are washed up African Americans, and it's, it's time we go back to our culture of being Africans, right? And protecting our people. Yeah, you know, because I tell people, I tell people all the time from my era, so I'm in a different era, right? We got gang members, we got gang bangers, things like that. And I tell people all the time, are you a gang member first or are you black? Are you a gang member first or are you black? Because if you're black, then you should be taking care of your people. You should be ma making sure your people uh, and protecting your people and things like that. That's why gangs was invented, right? To protect us from the police, right? In the in the system, right? So I feel like we gotta we gotta stick to our roots and things like you that. You talk about something very important because the gentr part of the gentrification process is criminology. Okay, so we see it all the time is that the media says that the neighborhood's bad, the property values stay low, the people don't want to live there no more, right? Because you're scared to go in your own door because they told you somebody gonna shoot you, right? Right? I mean, we can still see that happening over in North Minneapolis right now because they're trying to do the gentrification thing over there. So, but really, I've been over in North Minneapolis, my family, for 35 years, okay? And I'm gonna tell you, it's not nearly as bad. And the people that are moving around me, the neighbor, my block was once all black. No, that's right. Okay. That's so you get what I'm saying? And if this was happening here, happened in the, you know, you from Detroit, Michi. Have, okay? have you ever wondered though, like they say we have all this crime and they can't, the values are down, but as soon as they gentrify, all of a sudden everything yeah. goes up. There you go. Even before it's fixed, yep. all of a sudden it's worth more. Right. And the crime stops. So that <laughs> crime problem, you know, I think it gets extra, uh, what do you call it? Extravated is that the word? You know, to, to a higher level at oh, times when right. you know when they you know. I mean, look at here. Look at this area where we're sitting at. University Avenue is where Rondo sits. University Avenue and Lake Street are the most prosperous streets in the state of Minnesota. Aren't they? Or am I wrong? There's more prosperity happening along the University Corridor and Lake Street. And they're both sitting in the heart of what? Areas that have been gentrified, you know. So it's a serious, you know, and West Broadway over north is, is also a main corridor that connects many other little cities that where the money is generated for this state. And so it, it's, trust me, gentrification is not, it's a plan thing. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 74 years old, and I happen to be the person who wrote the proposal to buy a brand junior high school from the Minneapolis Board of Education. And I've had the opportunity to work in the Randall Summer University, South Minneapolis, and North Minneapolis neighborhood. In terms of the original question that Wes raised, the first African American of record in Minnesota was Jean Banga in the 1780s in the Arrowhead region, north of Duluth, up near the Canadian border. And there's a uh, township, Bunga Township, in Cass County, up near uh, Lake Mille Lac, yep. named after Bunga. The he married an Indian woman, and the Indian side of the family go by the name Bungo, and the African-American side of the family go by the name Bunga. And Jean Fountain was involved in economic development, and her son purchased and established radio sta uh, television station 41 up in the St. Cloud area. Also, Fort Snelling was where the early black settlers in Minnesota were located. Dred Scott and his wife Harriet gave birth to a son during the 17 years that he was held captive there in the 1730s while his case was moving through the Supreme Court, and the Dred Scott decision named after him says that Negroes have no rights which the white man is bound to respect. 
In addition, the, the 25th Infantry of the Buffalo Soldiers was stationed at Fort Snelling. And because of the discrimination at Fort Snelling, black settlers there moved downriver and settled in the area between the High Bridge and Seven Corners in downtown St. Paul, and then moved to the Rondo community, which was named after a man whose name was R-O-N-D-E-A-U, Rondo, who married an indigenous woman who was being discriminated against at Fort Snelling. And this community was initially a Jewish community. And when African-Americans began resettling here, just as in North Minneapolis, many of the Baptist churches still had a Star of David over the front door because they were synagogues before they became Baptist and Protestant congregations. The Jewish community lived in the Rondo neighborhood and then relocated. So um, the, people forget that Minneapolis is a suburb of the capital city of St. Paul, okay? And that it was in St. Paul where African Americans first settled because this was the hub for the Great Northern, the Northern Pacific, the Canadian Pacific Railroad. And a lot of black men got here by working on the railroad. We could remember those black men walking home in their railroad uniforms, and they would say, I walked all the way from Seattle to St. Paul, and my feet are killing me because they weren't allowed to sleep on the trains. They had to work around the clock. And then those black men, married black women, and a lot of black families settled in the Summit University Rondo neighborhood on the Lower East Side in the West 7th community in South Minneapolis and in North Minneapolis and call those communities home for multiple generations. So people came here for the same reason that people who had trouble with their weeds and their rubber use came here. They wanted good schools for their children. They wanted safety. They wanted jobs. There were a higher percentage of black people in this community in the 1950s who owned their own homes, who were literate, and who made a higher percentage of the salaries of white people who had the same jobs in the black community than anywhere else in the United States. And we need to ask ourselves how we have gone from the community that had the highest quality of life for black people in America to the 50th of the top 50 cities in the country being at the bottom in terms of education, in terms of economics, in terms of home ownership, and in terms of all of those qualities of life that are the reason why people come to a community and want to plant roots there and raise future generations. There was a part two to that question, but your passion has already spoken to that. Thank you for those answers. Uh, Mr. Cheney, why did most blacks live in St. Paul versus uh, Minneapolis in the early 1900s? I'm an activist, not a uh, historian, so you'll have to pose that question to the people who are better versed and well read on that okay. topic. I can answer. I just wanted to start with you. It's going all the way you just wanted to wake me up, huh? Yeah. You just wanted to wake me up. One thing about um, a lot of people don't know is there's a whole history of Rondo. The name Rondo comes, it's actually French. And you guys could probably speak to that. Uh, what was his first name, Yusuf? For the guy, he was he, the, the Jibbawe woman yeah, that he. From, uh, from Fort Snelling, yeah. His, it was, name, uh, it was uh, go ahead, what was it? D-E-A-U. D-A-E, -E, okay, yeah. right. So he was actually a white man. He was French, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the so he, he, he fell in love with an Ojibwe woman. The lands that we're on right now was, um, it was, what would you call the land back then? It would be more like. Uh, it's part of the Northwest or the Wisconsin territories. Yeah, and so basically, because at that time it was the Native Americans, right? But remember the Native Americans look like me and you today back then. Okay, that's one thing that they don't look like mostly the, the Native Americans that we call Native Americans today because my, <laughs> my people are native. My people are native from Oklahoma, the Oklahoma Trail of Tears, okay, my history. So, all right, make a long story short, he couldn't live in Minneapolis. Minneapolis was full of covenants. Minneapolis was up there like, you know, you're not going to live in this neighborhood. So they had covenants by law saying black people couldn't live in certain places. That's why. But 
This land here is where they migrated because remember we're sitting on the river as well. So you know through the the, the river, they you know a lot of people at that time were porters. I mean even some of my uncles and stuff they were porters and you know they worked the service jobs and stuff along on the ships and all of that sort of thing. So that's how they kind of migrated to the area. Of course, remember there was tyranny across America and other cities. So whenever there's tyranny in other places, you know, like for example, I mean, we got a whole history in America of tyranny, okay? So I don't even <laughs> need to go there, but, um, but that's basically how people migrated to St. Paul. And that includes many generations of my people as well, you know, were affected by the freeway and Rondo or what have you. So, um, and we didn't start, in, we started in St. Paul, okay? And then my family went to Minneapolis and my family loved Minneapolis more better. But we, you know, we, you know, wherever we lived, we had property. And that's one thing that, you know, I want to instill in all of y'all, but I'm gonna shut up because I didn't get off on the tangent. <laughs> Okay, okay, good, good. Yeah, we getting there. Y'all all right? Huh? Y'all getting this information, right? Because I'm telling this is a very distinguished panel up here and a wealth of information right here. Um, now, in knowing the history of this country and the massacre that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that, uh, you know, uh, what should, you know, like, in knowing all that, the Black Wall Street, what should Black Americans do? to protect their Black Wall Streets that we have established again and uh, if they are ever rebuilt. Let me uh, support. I, Kawa, Kawa in a uh, little look, bit. We all got to ask for that. Okay. Um, we'll start with the young. Yeah, you know, we'll start with the young. <laughs> um, I feel like whenever, whenever us African Americans build hope in our community, whenever we build hope in our culture again from, like you said, we, we are the toughest culture alive. You know, I don't think no other race could deal with slavery, you know, and survive slavery, right? And through slavery and through getting racial profile to getting ate by dogs, get burnt alive, get hung at every tree that you could possibly think of, we still created hope. We still created the Black Wall Street, right? But knowing this is in our this is in our land, knowing this is a place that we got brought to, that we didn't want to come there at one point in time, right? Because this that didn't welcome us, right? And like you said, we could build all the Wall Streets we want to, but long as they're in charge of the government, things like that, they could bomb us anytime they want to. They could shut us down every time they want to. As soon as we, grab, as soon as we build hope, they take it away every time. Every time because it's a system that they kept us in a box. And long as we stay in this box and stay puppets of these, these masters that they, they control and everything, we can't. We can keep on doing what we're doing as much as we want, as we want, but that racism is still powerful, and they can still shut us down anytime they want to, and they've been doing it every time. And that's the way. That's why how you take the hope away from the black community. We 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 fight, and we've been fighting for since we've been here for our culture to to make way for others, right? Harriet Tubman, making sure we all get to the a free slavery land, right? But at the same time, is they keep on taking hope from us every time we build it. Every time we build it. So how can we stop the government from bombing us? I couldn't tell you, right? How can you tell, how can you create this system and it, white, white supremacy is so thick right now, they don't even got to show up no more. It's in the system. It's in, it's better than the, in before we was even alive, right? So we living off other people's expectations and, and like I said, it's just, I think it's a, it's a tough road to go by. You know, I, I think we still build hope because that's what we're going to do to the day we, uh, to the day we die. But I feel like the government, you know, the government's still in control and the government is ran by white supremacists. So I feel like they're going to always keep us down, even though how much we build ourselves up and we're going to keep on building ourselves up because we were resentless as an African American culture. But we're not in control of the government and the government controls all of this stuff that we got. They control our pockets, they pay us and things like that. So. Yeah. I How think, we oh, I would say this. Um, I think that we have to take that hope and we have to turn it into action, right? I don't think we understand that we are at war, right? We're under attack. So we'll do a lot of building and we've done that in history, but we don't do a whole lot of protecting. I think it's time that we start forgiving our enemy. I think it's time that you see yourself as an American. I know we don't like to do that, but this land actually is ours. Right. It belongs to us more than anybody else. It was built on our blood, sweat, and tears. You are more American than anybody else that deserves to be in this country. This is our country, okay? 
So what you need to do is, just as much as we die for everything else, we got people who die every day over shoes, over what you're looking at, over jewelry, over everything else. So I suggest that we go get our gangs and our soldiers and give them a reason to die for something because we die in any way. I suggest we take up arms, then the next time they come bomb and we bomb back. I suggest we shoot them back, we kill them back, and we give them the same force that they have given us. That is the truth, and there is no other way around that. We will build and build and build, but we never have a plan of protection. You live in a country who has a military. Every country has a military. You have people. If you go to the Jewish communities, do you know they have their own police? They don't even call the other police. Go in the Jewish mini community and try and tear their stuff down. They got them curly cues on the side of their head and they look real nice. I bet you they fight come out if you think you're going to go in their community and destroy anything. I think as a race, we sit back far too much. And I won't go deep into that because I don't want to be offensive to anybody. But I think there have been things that we have been birthed into without a choice when it comes to the way that we are taught religion and things, even the way that Christianity is spoken to us. We are always taught to forgive the enemy. Turn the other cheek. Pray a little while longer. Well, I want you to stop praying. I want you to go get a gun, and I want you to get some bullets, and I want you to learn how to use it. That's what I think that we should do. You know, you should fight fire with fire. Far too often as black people in this country, we are never equally fighting with the measures that are coming back at us. And a young brother said something that we're scared to talk about, I think. He said, you know, how do you, how do you fight the government? Well, in your constitution, it says that if your government commits tyranny against its people, that would be us, right? The citizens of this country. Well, let me tell you something. You have the right to overthrow the government. Don't nobody want to do that. Y'all scared, huh? <laughs> we laughed at the white people that went to the Capitol. I respected that. Let me tell you why. Because when you are ready to fight and take it to the people that are really doing the damage and you have no fear of that, right? That's when they start to respect you. So when we start to understand that sometimes it's going to get, why are we the only ones that commit violence against each other? Everybody do violence on us. We can't be violent with other people. People don't want to hear that. We want to hear kumbaya. We want to hear Jesus going to do it. I'm telling you, Jesus not coming to save nobody from gentrification, from slavery, from oppression, or none of that. And so, yes, people think I'm crazy when I say that. And if you watch me, you know that. Some folks in here that say they watch me, they, they be like, me to give us another solution. Whenever you ask me my solution to the ultimate problem, it's time to overthrow the government. It is time to make them deal with the treachery that they have caused. And we might not want to hear this either. The way you get there is we unify ourselves and come together so we are strong as a black nation. But then you go to the other nations in this country of other races that are sick and tired of this government too because we not the only ones but that's how you protect yourself somebody kicking your door what you gonna do when they kicking your door i want however you will protect your home and somebody kicking your door that's how i want you to protect the new black wall street that we're gonna build protect it the same dang way lay somebody out that's uh, my answer let me, let me pick you back because what, what i was saying oh thank you if you go to north minneapolis crystal lake where my mother is laid to rest on her beautiful marker. The images of her and one of her pearls of wisdom. Take your rightful place in the world. Brother, you are a vision of possibilities to the young men and women you stand before. Know that. Know that. No disrespect to what you said, but that kind of dispute, disputes that right there because they look at you and you are their vision of possibilities. One thing we could all do to, right now when this panel concludes, get on the phone and tell somebody to get here because every one of these vendors has invested in ensuring we have a remnants of Black Wall Street. So folks need to come and invest in them. That's right. One way we do that is support each other. Each other. Some basic, some basic things. They don't even have to be very, I'm not calling it radicals. I'm ra I will die radical. I don't care. I was raised to be, and I'm unapologetically about and in love with us. 
But there's some things that we aren't doing. We got to start doing. We've lived the answers we seek. I'll say this. I tell my class, I teach. I'm like a Jamaican sister. Got about 10 jobs, man. I'm trying to do them. One of them things, one of the things I do is I get up every morning. I go to Gordon Parks High School down the street. And I stand before our young people and our babies and keeping my promise to my uncle, who my last visit with him in, before he died, my uncle Gordon Parks, he said, baby, what's gonna happen to black boys as revered as he was? He, before he died, he worried about the boys who looked like him when he was walking these streets of St. Paul, homeless, fighting violence and racism and poverty. He said, what's gonna happen to black boys? What did I really do? He questioned all of the things that he did as a Renaissance man, as an acclaimed photographer, filmmaker, artist, humanitarian. I said, Uncle Gordon, are you kidding me? I promise your living will not be in vain. And one of the ways I keep that promise is pouring into those young people at that high school. I talked to them about one day in the fourth grade at J.J. Hill Elementary School, I was cast as Harry Tubman in the school play. Remember it vividly. I asked my teacher when I was grown and we had lunch, I said, why did you cast me in that role? She said, as a little girl, I knew as a little girl, you would grow up dedicated to freeing your people. I played for the class, the trailer to Harry tell me where the sister is singing that stuff song. I'm going to stand up and take my people with me. Together we are going to to a brighter day. The video's powerful. You need to watch it. This young brother in my class had the courage to tell his peers, y'all know when I was locked up, this lady that reminds me is Miss Robin made us watch that movie. We didn't want to watch it, but when I watched it, I realized black people, some black bad folks, man, here, Miss Eric was bad. I fell in love with that movie, you know, y'all. I watch that movie with my mama all the time and we bad. He saw Harriet as a vision of possibilities. He fell in love with history. And because she did, he knew he could. That's the hope. For me, it's my faith that helps me press through. That's what armors me up to fight whatever. We're here, that we could walk through the doors, be patted down or whatever, that we're here. Now is my hope. But some basic things. Get on the phone, call somebody, tell them get over here today. I'm done. Okay, we, um, we're going to take one more. For the sake of time, because we want to give you an opportunity. I, yeah. I, I want to, okay, okay. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. I got this. You might be younger than me. Nobody say me. But I got this. You did not say me earlier. He right. You did say that. We're going to give you an opportunity to ask questions as well. Okay. So we don't want to cut into your time. Ain't that right? Right on. Right on. That's right. Okay. Now well, we, we do want to do Q and A too. So here's yeah. short. Yeah. Yeah. Two yeah. more answers. Yeah. I just want to. Yeah. Wait a moment. So when I say like, like, okay, like this, this era that we're living right now is being stripped of hope. Right. Like in, in words of Martin Luther King. Right. Martin Luther King was an aggressive person. Right. He went into the law books. He went to the governor. He went to the mayor. He went to inside the, 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 the government. Right. And work with the government. Things like that. Right. So I'm never going to send my people off by saying, yeah, go run in front of a gun. Right. And get shot. Right. And things like that. Because there's, there's different ways to do it. Right. We don't never want to match our precious uh, energy. Right. Yes, we you, do. You know, but. Yes, we there, do. There, there, there's different ways, right? There's oh, different ways. No. Be because no matter what, I don't want to install no negativity in my heart of no matter what. I'm here for a purpose. And like I said, I'm here, I'm here to why we fail. What you why you trying to be loving when they hating on no, you? No, no, no. Look, yeah, y'all scared to no, meet hate with hate. No, it's not about hate because and you said run in front of a gun. I didn't say that. I said go get you a gun, become skilled with your gun. Yeah. And, and, and take them out a mile away. You could be behind the bush. You ain't gotta run in front of the gun. I get the okay. Look, but look, check this out. Are now, you saying, are you what I'm what I'm saying is, if I stand right here and a sister come out the crowd and say I don't like you and she get the whooping on me, I'm not standing in faith and hope I'm gonna whoop her back. This is what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm not saying be I'm not saying just just get your butt. Well, I ain't never saying don't protect yourself. I ain't saying that at all. I'm just saying like 
me as being a leader mm -hmm. in, in my community and being a community organizer, I'm going to give you the right insight than just send you off and say, like, because you going to, and, and you taking advice, right? Say they take your advice and they go out there, now they're dead, right? And well, like, let's and, just bring this in the context. Yeah. So, we're one thing, one person that's missing here, which I'm very sad, is Dr. Rose. Uh. <laughs> She's one of our guests that was supposed to sit on this panel. Mm -hmm. She was actually raised in the Tulsa. Yes. Greenwood neighborhood. Okay. Mm -hmm. She was also my professor at the U of M, one of yes. my advisors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that happened, if you look at what happened at the massacre in Greenwood, mm -hmm. they didn't protect mm -hmm. their community. And I think that's what Nietzsche is saying here. We're yeah. not just talking out uh, of yes. no. no. Don't just we're run out, but 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 right. but in that community, let me yeah. say when that had happened, had the community understood the type of danger we are always in, what you would do is you would take a group of the community that is willing to prepare and to be our defense. And uh, so of course you don't just send them out there. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think that we have to make a plan to fight fire with fire. And, and just in recent years, I've even heard, even over North Minneapolis, just recently, some buildings up, you know, things are burned down, even with George Floyd. So, yeah. you know, there was some of our businesses were burned. I, I, sound engineer. Oh. oh, was it? A, okay, can you hear me now? All right, sound it. Okay. So even with George Floyd, we saw even some properties burned, Okay. That and some of that stuff you gotta kind of question, but you I don't know, think what, that was what the back. motive is when we see that kind of destruction. So I agree with you wholeheartedly that the only way that we can is to protect what we have, because look how much we lost. So if we just take Rondo in context, or even take Greenwood, you know, in in context. We lost a lot. We lose generations of wealth. I mean, 50, why do we wait, care wait, about wait, the wait, music? Wait, 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 wait. So how, you know, I mean. We got to wrap up because we okay. got to give them an opportunity okay. to ask okay. their yeah. questions. <laughs> but first of all, how about a round of applause for our distinguished panel? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yay. Conversation is getting good. Dang it, I got time. <laughs> now, with the show of hands, I'm gonna walk over to you with this microphone, with that lady in the green being the first one. I'm gonna have to run a little bit. <laughs> no, didn't wear my sneakers. Panel, you ready? Oh yeah. People ain't show. My name is Cookie Thomas, and I'm part of Priest and the Righteous Ones. So we're gonna entertain you today. Did you have a question? Um, Thank you for this excellent panel. Oh, I think you guys are great. Thank you. Yeah, you're hitting points that we really need to know out here. Um, I grew up in South Minneapolis. Uh, been here since my mother brought us here from Denver, Colorado. Um, been here since I was eight years old. And Minneapolis has really changed because when we came here, they had um, on Lake Street, they had all kind of sex stores and it, it, and it was just really, they had that deep throat movie. When I was a child, I seen that on Lake Street and they just, Lake Street was just totally $25 sex movies. I mean, 25 cents, excuse me, 25 cents sex movies, everything when I was a kid, we came here. So it's really changed and when, when, you know, when we came here, there was black owned businesses on 38th Street, Mr. Rubin's store, um, the black beauty salons, the black music store, all that was black owned. And now it's, it's, it's not anymore. It, it doesn't exist anymore for us. And so what I wanted to ask is how can we come back as a community to save what we already own. How can we come back to that? Thank you. Who wants to take the answer to that? Well, we are gonna have that discussion in the fourth panel. So if you stick around, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll have all those key players that are kind of playing a role into this whole economic development, like reconnect Rondo um, in this community and so on. But it's going to take us, of course, okay, like you were talking earlier, 
it is about behavior too that we have. So we have to own, as I keep saying, okay? Because we cannot be gentrified unless we own. Because, and then transfer property. We all gonna die, okay? So transferring your property back to your community or family people. I'm gonna tell you a story here. I just came back six and a half years ago. I lived in the DFW area for 12 years, okay? I invested in a piece of property. I had no idea about this, you guys. I was in Dallas, so I wanted to invest in some cheaper property because Fort Worth is like Minneapolis and St. Paul. Yeah. Minneapolis is way more expensive than St. Paul. I well, it has been, Trent, you know, mm -hmm. through the years. So I bought two pieces of property that were historic that sit off of Rosedale, if anybody knows Fort Worth. Um, 35W runs through Fort Worth, okay? And guess whose property it was? She was the first black principal of Fort Worth. Her name 